Good evening, poultry keepers. We are so happy that you joined us this evening. We have a really good show for you tonight, and it's it's very timely considering the economic times we're living in right now. It's how to cut costs without cutting corners. And, you know, and I would try, I'm going to try to do this without getting too political, but when you... Um, consider the conflict over in the Ukraine area and you stop and think about how much grain is in, uh, exported from Ukraine and also from Russia uh, that we're not going to be getting into the system so to speak this year and that's going to really drive the cost up the cost of uh, oil is driving up the cost of gasoline diesel and that is going to further increase our challenges and um, it's, you know, honestly, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. And I, I am woefully afraid that it's only going to get worse. So we want to share with you some ideas that we have about how you can save money, but not sacrifice uh, the quality of care that you're providing your birds in this show. Um, we're going to try a little bit different format tonight, and we're going to uh, just kind of bounce it around in the conversational style. Uh, who would like to go first? Karen? You're, nope. sitting over there <laughs> You're sitting over there smiling. Um, no, I, we didn't get to talk about this ahead of time because I wasn't prepared, but I believe that almost every thing everybody's going to say is about, is mostly about feed relation. Don't, don't waste feed. Don't, I don't know. There you go. That's all. Don't waste feed. Now y'all tell don't me how to feed. how to achieve that. That's what I want to know. Well, feed is your biggest cost, right? It, it's always going to be your biggest cost. And with the economic climate or with the agricultural climate out there right now, most of the common grains, corn, soybeans, wheat, oats, barley, have all nearly doubled in price. Okay, that's because of shortages throughout the Midwest. And in Canada, <clears throat> also had a crop failure in Brazil. Um, we can't import from, you know, Ukraine region any longer at the moment. Uh, and, and boat travel, you know, to import is difficult to, to begin with, right? All the boats are sitting somewhere out there off of a port waiting to get unloaded. It, it's just a horrible situation. So, you know, I've posted out there a couple times. Chances of you finding a high quality feed under about 22 to $24 a bag uh, just isn't going to happen. If they have real ingredients in there, right, and it's got any quality whatsoever, chicken feed's going to be in that middle $20 range. And I mean, you know, Rip, what are you paying? Or Karen it's, makes it's, her own, so I can't ask her. You know, you know, we're looking at around $27, $28 here, but living in florida everything has to be shipped in and so that just drives the cost up for every mile they have to haul that stuff we don't we don't grow any of our own grains down here nothing we have to bring everything in even if we were to, to make our own feed like karen does here uh it, it would be an expensive proposition yeah hey you know and Look, a lot of what we're going to talk about is wasting feed. And, uh, you know, Karen, you got that trough feeder on the ground. Um, you know, and I, I see a lot of these. Okay. So hopefully everybody gets a good view of that. But the bedding is feed because the feeder's on the ground. It never gets empty. The birds kick it out on the ground and there's feed everywhere. Right. But yet this you know someone like this will call me and say my feed bill's too high you know and then I, i'm like yeah i believe you there's no doubt in my mind that your feed bill is out of hand so there's ways of you know adjusting things that <clears throat> is going to save you a huge amount of money um karen get the <laughs> i literally video. just got it oh you want the video okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, so a friend of mine in Tennessee, Rebecca Lynch, um, she was kind enough to 
take this video for me, you notice that the feeder, the lip of the feeder is level with the average bird's back, right? So it takes away their leverage to be able to sort feed. You know, they can't get in there and plow their beak around and throw feed out on the ground. The other thing is, is she's feeding a controlled amount of feed. There's four birds in there, so she's only going to put a pound of feed in there for those birds, right? And they're going to clean it up. <clears throat> There's not going to be any waste. You know, this idea of full feed, letting them eat as much as they want, you know, all day long, every day, um, <clears throat> you turn them into buffet eaters. And what I mean by that is, if you've ever gone to a buffet, you know, Golden Corral, whatever, you know, you see people that fill up their plate, they only eat half of it, and then they go back for more. Well, that's what we're encouraging our chickens to do. And feeding habit is something that you want to change even like after the first week that they're born. Um, you you kind of want that feeder to get close to empty on a daily basis. Don't just keep throwing new feed in on top of old feed. That's ludicrous. You're training your birds to be spoiled, rotten little brats. So let's don't do that. <clears throat> or you can feed them, overfeed them, and Karen, you want to give us that picture? Oh, you ready for that already? Oh, why not? All right. So watch Nobody's your... asking questions. Well, they are. I'm just not showing that up there because uh -huh. um, I'm busy trying to get your picture. Ah, there so. they are. Okay. Um, so... All right, so I did a little necropsies uh, this week. So there's a chance that my birds, my cold birds, might be a little bit too fat. What do you think? Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the big unless you're unless you're running a whaling operation and you have a, <laughs> have a market for that blubber. I mean, we're <laughs> there's um, no money in fat. Right. And, and no we're assuming money. everyone knows that the yellow is fat. And I'm sure that's an obvious statement, but I just want to clarify. Right. At, and at we opposed, should have also warned them that we were going to yeah, show say, uh, graphic yeah. pictures at, at supper time. <laughs> oh. but <clears throat> Adipose tissue. Let's call it adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> hold on. Okay. Rip is back. Rip is back. Let's yeah, I don't know what happened. I didn't, everything just went dead and had to start over again. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so let me remove that. There you go. Um, all right, so we've got some more versions of feeders. Okay, I got that one up there. Yeah, and the nice one about that before you get rid of it is um, if y'all can see the, nobody can see where I'm pointing, sorry. Uh, <laughs> like the wood blocks on there, so it's adjustable. So as those chicks grow, you can raise it and lower it. The other thing that I like about that style of feeder is that it will move since it's hanging and that sort of helps keep them from wanting to perch up on top of that feeder sometimes, particularly the older they get, that mm -hmm. kind of deters them a little bit. <clears throat> you know, that's a homemade PVC trough feeder. Now for our purposes, we made this at Fertrell. Uh, for our purposes, we made this seven foot long. Um, these birds are only two weeks old, all right? And they're already tall enough to be eating out of this trough feeder. Um, <clears throat> and a plug for peat moss. Everybody look, this is peat moss bedding, in case you're wondering. And <laughs> the chicks love it. The one underneath the feeder is already dust bathing. And, and these are these are fairly unintelligent Cornish cross. Okay, so to get a Cornish cross, a commercial Cornish cross to start dust bathing at two weeks old is an amazing feat. But this works great. <laughs> Now, a full 10-foot length of PVC pipe will service 80 adult birds, okay, if you're doing groups. If you're not doing groups, you can make them whatever size you want. You want to assume uh, for the four-pound adult birds, uh, three inches of feeder space. And for the large heavy breeds, you're going to want closer to five inches of feeder space <clears throat> to service those birds. So when you put in a controlled amount, Everybody gets a chance to eat at the same time. Joseph says that he would like me to send him some of my cold birds so that he can make them schmaltz. So. That's good stuff. <laughs> um, 
Uh, you know, y'all you, were talking earlier, and if you expanded on that, I apologize, but just before my computer went haywire, uh, about full feed. And Jeff, for many, many years, I was very guilty of that. And that's how I was taught to do it. So that's what I did. And just a few days ago, I went back through some old records and figured out what I was paying for a feed back then. It was a custom custom blend feed, and it was not inexpensive. But I figured that I was easily overfeeding my birds two ounces of feed per day. And when you multiply that out and factor into the cost of the feed, I was feeding about $1,500 down the drain, so to speak. Um, $1,500 a year? $1,500 a year. I, I was maintaining at that time about 100 large fowl Rhode Island red adults. That doesn't, yeah, I wasn't factoring in the youth birds, the younger birds. But I, I had about 50 or 60 breeders, and the rest of them were show birds. Um, and, and then I really almost had a heart attack today when I factored in the, the, the rate of inflation since about 2000, which is the figures that I had. Um, and today that would be almost $2,500 worth of yeah. feed down to, you know, that was just wasted because I was not doing what I should have been doing all along. Is that per month or per year, Rip? Per year. Okay. Pretty but still, 1500 bucks is a lot, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That that's, almost th that's almost three tons of feed back yeah. in the day. Right. Don't, don't so. remind me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know, overfeeding, you lose money both directions, right? And we've shown you both, right? So Rip's explained the cost factor of it, and everybody gets the upfront cost factor. But the, the hidden factor, you know, is the picture of the bird with all the excessive fat, which is going to reduce your egg laying <clears throat> and your fertility, right? It's going to significantly reduce, uh, you know, eggs laid and fertility of those eggs laid. So you're, you're losing money on both ends by overfeeding your birds. <clears throat> I discovered that the hard way, too. <laughs> I, I just because I have nothing real to add I just want to say if you I struggle with the hanging feeder things because I don't have roofs on my things so hanging things from the sky is always difficult oh, gotcha. um, so I just hook. what get a sky hook get a sky hook okay yeah. so let me just say I've I've been using these for a long time now just and I don't obviously for adult birds, but if you go with something deep and small, they also don't, they can't, I mean, they can get in there if they wanted to, but it would, their whole body would take it up. But do you know what I mean? Like, but they can't, they, I get no spillage with those because they're deep. Do you know what I mean? They can't scratch their, you know, it's got a small thing. So mm -hmm. feeding out of something. Um, now that's a bird that's housed by itself or one or, you know, or a male and a female. You know I mean, obviously you're not feeding a, uh, only about five birds can get their heads in there at the same time from both sides. So um, you wouldn't want to, um, but just letting you know that sometimes something deep can also work if you can't. Right. Karen, do you use the um, little small black coop cups? I know you've got the show coops. Do you know what I'm talking about? A show? show yeah. Cup? I, well, I, I don't because I don't keep my birds in the show coops, but I know what you're talking about. I, I know a lot of people do when they're conditioning the, their birds, and I just wanted to point this out. A lot of folks don't realize. Um, and I tried to crop these pictures so nobody's birds would be identifiable in here. <laughs> uh, but this is an example of a show coop where somebody has been coop training their bird, and that's just wasted feed. That's all it is because of the show cups that they were using. They were using this one quart show cup. And if you see over on the left-hand side, it's kind of got a, a slanted front on it. And that makes it easier for them to build the feed out. Uh, and what even compounds it is those hooks that hook onto the wire on a show coop. Uh, also, there's enough room and enough play back there that it allows it to even tilt downward 
uh, even more, so they waste even more feed. But exactly to what you're saying, if you use something a little bit deeper, that the one I just showed was a one pint cup. This is a, a one quart cup. Uh, it's hard for them to build that feed out. Plus, that also has a much straighter side to it. Yeah. Uh, well, well, in mine, you know, at the most, if there's two birds in there, I'm giving them, you know, eight ounces of feed. It's just a tiny little bit at the bottom. Right, you know what I mean, it's right, not like right. it's halfway full like that one. You know what I mean? It's just that. Um, but obviously, it's still too much. So we're not going to talk about that. But <laughs> yeah. Um, but let's see. So we got some others. So Ingrid, oh, sorry. Um, Ingrid talked about that you can also put a hanging feeder on bricks at the right height to if you don't have anything to hang from and then melissa tells us that she runs a pipe through the wire to hang feed from so okay pipe through the wire i believe you <clears throat> like a curtain rod karen so, oh okay okay yep. yeah that makes sense I'm like, <laughs> through the wire i'm like then it has to go to another wire but you mean like flat against it I got yeah it. yeah yeah putting a pipe through the top and then you can hang from that Gotcha. Um, all right. So the other thing about you talked about free feeding and that they don't need that, but does all does free feeding ever feed you know wildlife instead of your birds? It does. So uh, those feed out overnight. Those instances where you saw the feed on the floor of the coop mm -hmm. that attracts rodents. Yeah. It also attracts insects like darkling beetles beetles excuse me um and they can carry disease not only can they carry disease rodents will actually eat the feathers off your chickens i, I don't know how many times i've had folks come to me and say you know and they'll send me pictures of what happened to my chicken feathers i said you got rats or mice or sometimes roaches will even eat the feathers off of them so that's another reason not to keep overfeeding your birds yeah i tell people if you've got layers it's just a matter of time until you have rats. Yep. Um, and and that's really all in your feed storage and how you manage your feed. But once they show up, they soon learn that they like eggs too. And mm -hmm. they'll carry off eggs. Um, I actually have had several instances where in the middle of the night while the birds are roosting, the rats would go through and tickle their toes and startle them. And this will cause a bird to dump the egg. Um, <clears throat> it's called egg drop syndrome, but it'll the, the bird will lose the egg if it gets startled in the wee hours of the morning before the shell goes on. You just get a, a membrane egg and soft egg. Now, now and, let's be let's be careful. Let's not talk about egg drop syndrome in the United States. Sorry. What's that? <laughs> Why? Because egg drop syndrome is a terrible thing in other countries, and we don't yet have it. So let's leave it out in those countries <laughs> keep lucky but, but the rats figure it out rats are quite intelligent so they'll figure out you know how to get those eggs just and, a matter and, of time you know rats will take baby chicks as well eat those uh, yeah they stuff I, them in the wall they save them for later yeah when i when i locked my birds up um when they were over here at night and there was just that tiny little layer on the bottom of feed left and in the morning there was rarely was there any feed in the bin so in the in the feeder so between the actually slugs can slugs eat up i don't know but it i mean i feel like there's all these slug things through my through my trails through my feeders and crickets and like you said that just everything is eating well crickets really like chicken feed because mm -hmm. actually at cricket farms yep. uh, their feed is pretty much the same as chicken feed yeah um and you know, slugs are going to be after those carbohydrates as well. So pretty much, you know, a lot of the insects are going to be after that spilled chicken feed. All right. Laura wants to know, oops, um, how about the homemade feeders? Oh, actually, they're selling them now, too, that are the 90 degree elbows into buckets or totes. You know, I'm, I'm having a hard time visualizing that. Oh, uh, yeah. They're, it, it, you, you drill a hole in the bucket at the right height and then yeah. you they stick their oh. head in there keeps them from i laura haven't seen one up close and personal personal i mean i just I, I i don't know yet they the concept looks really good but i can't say for sure 
The one area I've seen people get in trouble with those is they work fine on the hens, but if they have uh, single comb males with large combs, they can't actually get their heads in there to eat. Hmm. And the only thing I'd say is that I feel like most people who use those are trying to put them on a five gallon bucket or on a 50 gallon bucket or drum and it's because they don't they want to feed them once a week so yeah. then you're yeah. back to letting them right free feed and any yeah. any chances with mold and everything else getting into the feed more then mm -hmm. nah. just depends on the weather but that's always a always a an option or always a mm -hmm. possibility so yeah especially if it's humid it's never humid in North Carolina. No. Nope. Um, hmm. Move to Florida. We got humid. I, I'm just kidding. I was kidding. It is. It, you're right. Now this is Florida. That's all those people who dry hatch in North Carolina. I'm like, no, you don't. You live in North Carolina. There's no way to dry hatch. Um, I so Maggie uses heavy duty shepherd's hooks for hanging the feeders from. So yep, see, everybody can find a way to figure it out, except for me. Um. <laughs> um all right. All right. So who's got something other? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let's get back to, uh, I think this is Dennis. How much feed per adult English Orpington should they be getting a day? Now, I don't know the weight of an English Orpington off the top of my head, but I'm guessing somewhere around eight pounds. Yeah. So I would say um five for sure maybe six ounces again it depends on the quality of the feed you know and how well it's put together um without knowing the energy level of the feed it's it's a guess but i would say try six ounces uh in the summertime you're probably fine at five ounces per bird per day jeff do you have a general rule of thumb like x percentage of body weight uh depends on what the purpose of the bird is um, I've kind of gone with one ounce per one ounce of feed per pound of live weight. Okay. But when you get up to maintenance and on show birds, <clears throat> that can be too much. Um, it depends on what their activity level is. And again, it depends on how that feeds put together. You know, you and I both know that, that yeah. it's a wide range of energy levels and how feeds are put together. So, right. So, and Rip, for yeah. Robert here, how many ounces of feed should a standard bread bar rock and rose comb Rhode Island white? Oh, I want some of those. Um, eat on average. <laughs> um, that would. They're they're cool birds, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> like um, I'm taking probably five, maybe six ounces. Uh, I, I'm got got mine on um, my bar rocks on about five maybe five and a half ounces a day and they're they're doing well on there they're they're not but they're young birds so it, it, i can't really tell if they're putting on a lot of excess fat at this point well they don't feel like it and i just i just want to say because i don't have a solution for this is i do limit my feed and i change the feed for the seasons and they get a holding diet when they're not laying eggs and I still am obviously struggling, so I don't know that there's just a feed problem. I got a problem on the other end during the molt, I think. How much are you feeding, Karen? Um, so I give I give my my males get six ounces. My females in, of the breeder feed they get five and a half. Um, they only get four ounces in the summer because they don't tend to fill it up, and so part of it is. If they're, and this isn't a set counseling session for Karen, but um, when they're individually housed, I don't have any problem giving them exactly, you know, but like I put everybody back together for the winter and then it's a lot harder to say you get four ounces and you get four ounces and you get four ounces. So I feel like some birds just get more when you're feeding six of them together. Do you know what I mean? It's a lot less. You can give them a set amount of feed, but they don't just eat theirs and walk away and let their neighbor have the other ones. Yeah. In groups, it's hard to monitor that um, unless that's where the trough feeder kicks in. So yeah. you can spread it out. And that yeah. way, everybody gets a fair, yeah. a more fair chance. 
you know, the other thing is, is you're making your own feed. <clears throat> and I may have made that feed a little too rich for your bird. Yeah. So, you know, and maybe I need to do further adjustments based on your climate, you know, your temperatures and things like that. So, or I just need to feed less. I mean, right. it's hard to, let me ask this because of the time of year. And again, Karen's counseling session, um, going when I'm literally trying to hatch right now, this doesn't seem like the time to cut back on their feed. Like, is it? Well, based on your pictures of the birds you showed. <laughs> Remember, those um, were the calls. I want to just say those were the ones I chose. That's fine. Feed, but, but, you know, uh, pick up some of the other ones and squeeze. Well, yeah, they got lots. You know, yeah. Huh? They got, They've lots. got a lot of fat. Yeah. Okay. I think you could ease back. Um, you know, based on what I saw, I'm thinking you could actually ease back to four ounces and your birds would do just fine. So even my eight pound birds are. Yep. I'm thinking maybe four ounces yep. of so my particular I, feed. I am partially to blame for where you landed with your birds. So, uh, no, so. Um, all right. So this is uh, Dennis following up with his Orpingtons are eight pound females, ten pound males, feeding show stock, and or maybe that's not feeding. Neutrino feed with Fertile supplement. Does that help? We still on six ounces. Um, yeah, I mean, six ounces is going to be the high end and, you know, then feeling for that pad fat, you know, doing it, you know, picking up birds, feeling for the fat, um, learning how to feel for the fat, which there's an art to that, right? I, I can't say that I'm good at it, but <clears throat> learning to feel for that fat and you know, you're adjusting your feed based on what you're feeling, you know, in that abdomen or that pad fat and going from there. Um, you know, Dennis also, if you ever lose one for some reason, you know, mysteriously dies, then you for sure want to, you always want to open up a bird that dies by accident or old age or whatever happens. Because you want to know what's going on inside there because that'll give you clues for what the rest of the flock is doing, you know, and we can make adjustments based on that. And when you do that necropsy like Karen did, take pictures at every stage along the way and share with somebody that you trust who's knowledgeable and says, can tell you, hey, you know, you got too much fat, you know. Um, <clears throat> we didn't look at the liver picture on Karen's. I don't know if she has access to that, yeah, but. I can go back to that. Yeah. So. See the liver in the, in the center there? Um, how pale, I, I use the term caramel colored, but it should be a deep dark red. Okay. Yeah, I, I put the picture of the male's liver up in that upper corner to show more of the correct <laughs> liver uh, color. In the, yeah, in the upper left, that's yeah. that's a closer color to what it should look like. But right in the center of the, the hen picture, mm -hmm. that tannish caramel color is the liver. And it, and it really does need to be like a deep burgundy red. Mm -hmm. So that's fat that's building up. She's trying to filter that fat out. <clears throat> And that's it's fat buildup in the liver, so the liver's not functioning um, near a hundred percent. So it was. So there's a lot of negativity to overfeeding, or right? there's a lot of negatives to. I just want to. These are some different birds, but so the bird in the middle with the egg in her abdomen, she actually has had a like a. She's that's her crop, just full of grass that she's had in there for years because she hasn't had access to that much grass in, in a while. <laughs> so, I mean, she managed to get that fat even at with a, a stopped up crop. But so, but even all the way up into their neck, like, should they have fat up in their, around their trachea? <laughs> That's not natural, is it? Uh, they will. I mean, okay. so their instinct when the days start getting shorter in the fall, you know, when they quit laying and the days get shorter, their natural metabolism slash instinct is to store body fat for winter, right? And they're supposed to be surviving on that when times are tough and they can't find, you know, food uh, readily available. But we keep feeding them and they don't need to ever burn that off. <laughs> so stop feeding them. No more food in the winters. That's my new plan. Um, all right. Craig has a question. 
With HiPath AI showing up around the country, he wants to minimize my his trips to get feed. How long can I keep feed on a pallet in spring and summer months with warmer humidity? It's a good question. Um, which I, and I think it's that's kind of a tricky answer because the feed is freshest within two weeks of it being milled. Thirty days is um, optimal. After thirty days, it gets a little bit the palatability goes down because the starches start to oxidize. Um, but pellet feed's going to last a little wrong, longer, right? Um, especially in the summer months, depending on where you are in the humidity, I would say probably no more than two months. And that might be pushing it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know, if, if we can keep it in airtight containers, it's going to go a long way. Um, I even have some folks that because of where their feed is coming from or where they have to go to get it, <clears throat> they actually picked up an old chest freezer, um, you know, Craigslist, uh, Facebook marketplace, whatever. And they're putting their bagged feed in that, <clears throat> in those freezers. You know, one, it keeps it de dehumidified. Two, it keeps it cold. So you decrease the breakdown. And it's also fairly an airtight, um, you know, environment. So you can extend, uh, I would comfortably say an extra 30 to 45 days, you can extend your feed out. So normally we would say 30 days is, is your outside, like Alyssa said, on a pelleted feed in the bag. You know, I've done okay with 60 day feed, but it's not great. Uh, but if we can do anything to improve the environment, then um, you know, the storage environment, it's going to help out a lot. Um, all right. So Ingrid wants somebody to talk about grit and its effect on cutting feed costs. Yep. 10%, you know, I I'm becoming the grit king all of a sudden. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to preach grit until I die because. Hopefully that's you know, no time the, soon. Hopefully. And, but, you know, grit is the same equivalence as teeth are to you and I. So they can't break down and process their feed, you know, without the grit, <clears throat> without the right size grit, you know, and large birds are talking quarter inch. Um, you have that grit picture still, Karen, or do I need to resend it to you? Um, but, you know, grit is quarter inch size or larger, you know, crushed stone with sharp edges and... I've seen several studies, but a good friend of mine did one, uh, Craig Haney, and he saw a seven to 10% decrease in, increase in feed efficiency, decrease in feed intake, right? So <clears throat> he saved roughly seven to 10% on his feed bill by making sure the birds never ran out of grit. And yeah, that's huge. And grit really isn't that expensive and it stays in the gizzard for a long time. So like uh, the data is on things like the <clears throat> Cornish cross, but the average Cornish cross is only going to eat six and a half ounces of grit in its life. Okay. So now a mature laying hen going to go through about two pounds of grit in a year, right? That's, that's really all. If it's the right size, she's only going to go through two pounds of grit in a year. The 150 pound bag will do 25 hens for pretty close to a year. Just rough numbers, but it's, you know, grit. I don't know. If, you, if you're not willing to feed grit, quit raising chickens. It really comes down to that. Okay. It, it's cruel and inhumane to have chickens without grit. And, and Jeff, I want to throw this in there too. I know a lot of folks think that they're because they're feeding oyster shells or the little crumbles of calcium carbonate that that will function the same as grit. It will not because the chicken's crop is is acidic in nature, so it's it's gonna it's not gonna last very long at all. You want the pure granite grit. Yep. Yeah. The the calcium sources are the coarse calcium. It just it's a lot softer as well. So it's not yes. going to stay in the gizzard quite as long. Yep. You're right. Grit. Uh, rip. <laughs> got crit on the mind. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things in my life, but I don't think that was one of them. 
but well, on this day in history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's got who's got a saving cost that's not related to don't waste feed? Call early, call hard. All right. Get them, Rip. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, now is the time when you really should be evaluating your birds very, very closely uh, and culling those birds that are borderline producers or borderline breeder birds. If they're borderline, I would encourage you to cull those birds from your flock. Uh, I've had to do that three times, or twice, excuse me, twice uh, due to relocating. And I, I cull my birds down to the top 10% of birds that I had in my flock and my breeder birds. And I can honestly tell you that by doing that, not only did I obviously save money, but the quality of my birds actually increased over the, the following years, the following three or four years, because I had kept only the best of the best. Um, there was at one point, I, I, I had almost a hundred Rhode Island red females. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Uh, <laughs> uh, that totally blew my mind where I was going with this now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll take but, that up. You, focus. Um, you know, I, I would have 100 Rhode Island red females. Did I need 100 Rhode Island red females? I thought I did at one point. <laughs> but when I call that down to a much more manageable number, you can, gosh, you can hatch a lot of chicks off of 20 females. And, and keep your breeding program going and produce better birds in the long run. Um, you know, look at your chicks very hard when you when you take them out of the, the uh, hatcher. You know, do you have curled toes? Do you have cross beaks? Um, those are things that you can probably call down. I had a, I was very fortunate and I had um, an arrangement with my feed store that I would take them the birds that didn't have serious flaws like curved beaks and that kind of stuff, but um, maybe they had a narrow head that I didn't want to keep or something or, or slightly twisted toes. And I, I would take them to the chicks and we would swap out chicks for feed. So that saved me a little bit of money um, on, on my feed cost as well. But I, I, again, I would encourage you there is no better time than right now to take a good hard look at the birds that are in your flock. If you have layer birds and these birds, you have birds that aren't laying, they're costing you money. They're costing you money and they're not giving you anything in return. If you had birds that are borderline breeders that you kept because, well, you know, I'm, I, she's got something about her I like, but does she have something about her that's really special? that you need to keep her for that 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 ultimately for me is is my deciding factor are these really special birds if they're not i but. i told number 461 today that everybody else in her age range has started laying so she's got one week <laughs> nothing like that, a good threat to make them come right. across like you got one week <laughs> that, <clears throat> so Man, Rip said that selection thing so passionately. I thought he was selecting a wife, not a chicken. So, yeah. <laughs> well, the door shut. My wife can't hear you say that. <laughs> um, nobody in the whole world is going to agree with me on this one, but I think a little bit about what are you feeding. Um, I when I first started was super starry eyed. I started out my hundred chicks on organic, soy free, corn free feed. Um, and was going fine actually we're growing pretty good on it despite what may happen sometimes but you know get about 10 weeks old and now i'm feeding 110 week old chicks so we're going through more than a bag a day and all of a sudden i can't afford to keep going <laughs> do you know what i mean with that you know so then i decided to supplement with you know what they give away at the farmer's market oh bad produce so i mean i was i went to a good 25, 30% of my diet of those growing chicks from the farmer's market. I'm out there washing gross stuff off of everything every day. Um, but I mean, that put me back. Then 
just FYI, I went to like start having trouble with my keels and I didn't know, was it because I gave them no nutrition when they were growing out or is it genetic or so, I mean, it took me a whole nother year to get th battle through where my problem was coming from. So I lost a whole year to that because I decided now if I had more money, that would be different. But, you know, I do not need to feed organic coin free, soy free for my backyard chickens. Um, so choosing something I can afford to continue on in the numbers that I, you know, want to do is was important for me. So. Another thing I want to throw out there too, that, um, is a problem I know for some folks, um, who have been able to free range their birds and because of the high, high pass AI, uh, they're not able to do that now because one of the things you need to do is get those birds covered up one way or the other. And then that, that to do that means um, you got to shut your birds up. So the, they're going to eat a little bit more feed than they would if they were out on free range. So it's a, another good reason to look at some of all the things we've talked about tonight. All right. Jeff, you got any other? I know I didn't give you any time to prep for this. Well, I wanted to expound on your feed story, you know, okay. so you started out, you wanted to buy the best feed you could, which is great, right? <clears throat> now, was soy free the best option for you? Probably not. But, it, you know, I understood where you were coming from. And, you know, we tend to do that. But you, know, you I see the flip side of that coin. I see a, a huge amount of people that for a long time, they go to the store and they see 16% laying mash, 17% laying mash, whatever. And uh, they really don't pay attention to the tags, the ingredients or anything. It's like they make some mental assumption that all feeds are created equal, right? And they just, so to them, if it's 1595 or 1695, well, they're gonna get to 1595, right? And they just, and they, you know, folks, you gotta read the labels. You got to read the labels you need to compare. You need to, <clears throat> you know, get some resources that can guide you through good feed, bad feed based on the ingredients and that guaranteed label. But, you know, most of the folks that are listening, <clears throat> I believe are breeders or people who want to have really high end either show fowl or breeding fowl. You can't feed them off the shelf feed. It, it just, they're going to live. They're going to look okay. They may not look great, but they're going to look okay. Pretty good. Um, but you're missing out on a huge amount of potential. The other thing I'd tell you is that <clears throat> properly pre pre prepared feed, you can feed roughly 15 to 20% less and get the exact same results. So you get what you pay for is I guess what I'm trying to tell folks. So, you know, don't just compare all feeds based on price. You know, you know, step up, get the better stuff, control the amount that you're feeding and see the results for yourself. Jeff, I, I, I have a question for you. I made a little note here while you were talking, but what form of feed is wasted the least? Is it mash? Is it crumbles? Is it pellet? Ah, uh, rip. That's a question I wish you hadn't asked, but that's <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. You know, so look, they came out with pelleted feed to reduce waste, right? So there's several reasons why pelleted feed was, was invented. One, it moves through automated feeding systems in commercial barns much more effectively, more, much more efficiently. The other thing is, is it is specifically designed to put weight on a bird you know, faster, like they can compact everything into one bite sized morsel, you know, and they can get it into the bird. <clears throat> um, you know, my mentor 26 years ago, you know, he had no time for pelleted feed. You know, he just said, Hey, make a coarse mash and go with it. Don't spend the extra $40 per ton, uh, $1 a bag to have it pelletized. Two reasons. One, the cost. Two, you have to put byproducts in there to get the pellet to form. To get a good pellet, mm -hmm. you've got to put wheat middlings or a byproduct mm -hmm. in there to get a good formed pellet. Well, 
there's no nutrition in that, right? You're not helping your bird whatsoever. So that, you know, a minute ago when I was talking about getting a good high quality feed compared to, you know, your average chicken feed at Tractor Supply, and I'm not picking on Tractor Supply, they provide a service. But <clears throat> it's really not a, you know, there's that 15 to 20% because that's how much wheat middlings is going into that mix to make a pellet or a crumble, right? You can train, I'm going to get shot for this statement, but you can train any bird to eat a mash feed, right? They're not going to like it initially because all they ever knew was pellets. But you can, you know, now even Karen switched from mash feed and went to pelleted feed. Why did you do that, Karen? Well, part of it is being afraid that they're not eating the fines, that, that they're leaving the, the most important part behind in the feeder. Um, but part of it's just ease. Like, like you said, instead of having to take off the powder and put a new food and put that back on top and, you know, and they did make a bigger mess when they had that. There was more food on the ground, which led to more work for me to have to keep the ground cleaned off. But so. that being said, Karen does not have any byproducts in her pellets, right? Because they don't have to travel 500 miles from the feed manufacturer to the showroom store and be thrown around by people and still look good, right? So she, we know exactly what's in her pelleted feed and, <clears throat> you know, in complete control of that. So it, it works well for Karen. Yeah, but the ones I make myself are not as hard as the ones I buy at the store. I have no. to be more careful with them. Yeah. All right. All right. A good question here. So Craig wants to know how much fines in feed is acceptable, and is it a sign of the age of the feed? What kind of feed is it, Craig? Oh, sorry, go on, Karen. Sorry. <laughs> Greg, what right, kind of feed is it? Is it is it crumbles or is it pellets? What kind of feed? Well, and also, what are the feed ingredients? If you're feeding a mash that has a bunch of meals in it, like soybean meal, um, then you're going to see a lot more fines than if you've got roasted soybeans. Okay, so he uses mini pellets. Um, oh, I don't know that. Yeah, in well, a mini that's pellet, like, that's actually in a not mini him. pellet, Hold you're on. still going to... Okay. In a mini pellet, you're still going to have 1% to 2% fines. That's just from transporting it. It's not really a sign of the age of the pellet or that the pellet's breaking down or getting any worse. It's, you know, if you could find out where it was actually manufactured, how far did it travel before it got to you? I, I think that's more of a reason, you know, and how it handled when it gets to the store. You know, there's a lot of things that cause that. Um, but look, feed manufacturers right now everywhere, whether it's Neutrina, Purina, I don't care. They're all scrambling for feed ingredients right now. They'll try and hold costs down. So the pellets probably have changed, or you will see changes in those pellets to try and maintain or try and help hold costs down, you know, because they don't want to lose market share. Right. And if you see more than 10% fines in your pellet, the, that's not a good pellet. Yeah, it's not a good pellet. Um. So he half a mile. Craig says that half a mile. Half a mile. It's not very far. Yeah, as long as it's one to two percent, Craig. I don't see it as an issue. Um, the other thing is, what are the ingredients? Because if mm -hmm. it's like Karen and they're actually using all really good ingredients, then it's not. You know, I, I'm not concerned about that little bit of fines. Yeah, and also like high fat. Um, so if they're using, again, I'm going to talk about roasted soybeans, roasted soybeans instead of soybean meal in that pellet, it's not going to be as strong of a pellet either. So what's going into it is relevant. All right. Uh, Alyssa, I'm going to let you answer Ingrid's just because Jeff's audio is being weird. Um, so is it fair to say that feeding a more expensive feed in proper quantities will pay for itself more than a cheaper feed fed free choice? I think she's summarizing what we said earlier. <laughs> Yeah, in theory, yes. And as long as that in expensive feed is a well-balanced feed. Um, yeah, so and then you got to look at a chicken is going to eat for their, their protein or I'm sorry, their energy requirements. So if you're feeding a cheaper feed that has 
high level of byproducts, then the, they could be eating more feed because the energy is going to be lower. And then that's, that's more of a waste. And does that and make sense? I just want to say this one thing, and I'm probably, I shouldn't call out my names, but when, when I talk to people who are having trouble hatching, like mm -hmm. some people go too far in the most expensive feed. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like the yeah. organic nature's best feed from Tractor Supply is one of the most expensive feeds they have. And you can't hatch an egg on that stuff. Like it, the feed itself, it's very expensive, but it is, it is just not yeah. at all effective. So mm -hmm. yeah, so, expensive doesn't always mean that it's good. Yeah, that's all. That's yeah, all. thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Jeff, do you want to try? Just getting out and coming back in and seeing if that helps. I don't know if it will or not. Because he's pixely too. Yeah. All right. Here's one for Rip. No. Is it more cost effective and efficient if I separate my hens from the roosters into their own living areas, hen houses and bachelor pads? Um, roosters getting the unneeded calcium, etc. I'm I'm probably not the best qualified person to answer that because I never did. You know, I, I always kept my hens and my males together 12 months out of the year, basically. Um, and, and part of that was because it was an easier thing to take care of birds if I didn't have a bunch of pens scattered all over the heck, you know, uh, pen of females here, pen of females here, pen of females, and then three or four pens of males over here. I had so many at one point, and that was dumb on my part. I, I admit that. Um, it, it was just easier if I kept everybody lumped together. And, and uh, you know, you got to kind of figure that your time is worth something, too. You know, that's that's a cost in, in raising poultry. And I never had any problem doing that. So The only thing I want to say is, oh, I you go first, Alyssa. No, go on. Um, is I have found that I, when I house my birds, absolutely singly it i know so much more about them do you know what i mean i know way more mm -hmm. about my birds so it's easier to call it's easier to see who's doing what it's easier to i mean it's just i just like i said it's more just it's a selection thing really more but i just like i said i i'm much more intimately acquainted with my birds when they're housed singly than so that helps me pick so, but it's not really cost effective. other than if you could actually get rid of them, then it would be cost effective. Man, I, you know, I think the bottom line is if you've got a system that you like and it gives you the results you're looking for, carry on, you know, <laughs> don't let what I say or anybody else say sway what you're doing if you're successful with it. Yeah. Uh, however, do listen and try to figure out ahead of time because I built all my infrastructure to house them in groups of five to 20 and now i'm switching over and building all my infrastructure to <laughs> keep the same number of birds all by themselves so that's not the most cost efficient way to do things um all right can soaking and fermenting cut down on feed costs jeff i'm gonna let you answer that one <laughs> i have not seen that to be true but i have heard reports from reputable individuals who say that they have uh, reduced their feed cost by soaking and doing a three-day ferment. Um, to remind that would be particularly like a three-day ferment is uh, it's back to a lot of what the grit was doing. The bird is more easily can more easily assimilate the nutrients out of a soaked feed or a wet feed than they can out of the dry. I don't know how much it's actually going to reduce it. Um, five, maybe 10%. I would comfortably say 5%. But that would be, that would be my thoughts on it. I don't know. Uh, we did a field trial here about wetting the feed, you know, and making it wet. And we got no growth performance differences whatsoever uh, with, with just soaking the feed. But like I said, I'm hearing from really reputable people that it's 
it's making a difference. Yeah, and there's there's added labor to soaking and fermenting too, so you got to take that into to account. Um, so there was an article put out in the APA Grit. I don't remember how long, um, and I think Mike Badger might have written that article on comparing the feed costs of soaking and fermenting. And I read it a while ago, and I can't remember the exact information on it. But if you can dig into the into those archives, it might be able to give you more information if you're interested. There was one. I remember once that I have to see if I can dig it up, and I can put it in the file section on our. Uh, Poultry Keepers 360 group. Don't be putting APRA membership information. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, okay. That's all. This Sorry. was done as part of a federal grant. Um, let's see. I think we, I don't know. So I know I've noticed Carol has enjoyed her birds more. Let's see. I've noticed since Jeff helped me by formulating my feed for layers and breeders, my chicks are very hardy. So kudos you know it's a good point having birds survive and live that's, mm -hmm. that's a better way to go than having dead birds that that's an expensive way to raise them up till right about to breed them and then have them drop dead that's a very wasted <laughs> very wasted <laughs> not ideal um all right Anybody have anything about water quality, pH, et cetera, and the effects on metabolism? Not sure. I think this is a general question. I saw that. That's an interesting question. No. Okay. So, yes, the answer is slightly acidic pH water will enable a higher level of digestion. So, you're looking good water is between 6.7 and 7. So, that's where you really want to be. Uh, even water down 6.5, 6.3. But be careful because there's a lot of hype out there about intentionally acidifying the digestive tract on chickens. Um, there's some people getting crazy with this. I mean, they're dropping pH down in the fours. And, and that's where vinegar's at. So there's no need to do that. Uh, let's not get, you know, let's not get that crazy about it. But uh, five, six, seven is going to have a little bit better, uh, a little bit better nutrient absorption. <clears throat> so water quality and really high pHs, like uh, up in the Dakotas and up into Alberta, up into Canada, a lot of their water up there is running in the eights, eight point two. Um, that's where I would want to look at some form of acidification to get that under control because there's a lot of nutrients that are just bypassing the digestive tract and never getting absorbed. So it depends on where you live. And honestly, I wish everybody would get their water tested. You know, uh, water is twice as important as feed because birds consume twice as much water as they do feed on a daily basis by weight, by weight. Okay. So, um, yeah, water, water is huge. Right. Number two in the golden rules of raising poultry, air quality being number one. All right. So Sarah wants to know if any of us ferment. And I'm going to give two people. So anybody on this screen, Rip, have you fermented? I have meat? done it. Okay. Um, I didn't do it for maybe a month or two just because of, of what Alyssa was talking about. It. it a somewhat labor intensive project process and I was working probably 80 hours a week at that point um, in my career and I, I just didn't have time to do it. I, I, I didn't, I don't think I did it long enough to be able to tell anyone that I noticed a difference. But I can't say that I did. I am absolutely terrified. I'm convinced if I ever tried to fur my, my feed, it would get moldy and gross. I wouldn't realize it and I would kill all my birds. That is, I'm sure it wouldn't happen, but that's, I'm not, I, that's why I don't. Um, but I do, so somebody else chimed in. So Dennis does feed soaked feed, which is what honestly I think most people are talking about when they claim they ferment their feed. Um, they're not actually getting it to a full ferment. They're just getting it wet for a while. Um, so he says it's definitely cut down on costs from wasted feed. So that's another of how not to waste feed and they seem more lively. 
And some of that, I think, in those APA studies was sort of more of just that was a good way to get water into them. Definitely. And, Especially yeah. when it's colder. Yeah. They're not drinking as much. So that can help everybody feel healthier, too. So. Definitely. Uh, all right. So Ingrid wants us to say it again because she loves her. So what is the most cost-effective type of bedding? Alyssa, go. What do you like? Uh, peat moss, <laughs> definitely. Um, peat moss is going to be more absorbent. It's got a naturally low pH, which makes it antimicrobial. Um, and the chicks love it. All right. So let's go. Let's just expand a tiny bit. What if they're not baby chicks? So what if they're adult birds? They'll love it even more. <laughs> because <laughs> they're bigger okay uh, they'll, they'll probably dust bathe in it too um so yeah I, I, again that goes back to like it's more absorbent also and that that antimicrobial that lower ph is is also beneficial when they're older as well so. i think the most effective cost of bedding is a uh, pasture called moving Ooh. your birds around yeah <laughs> They all didn't buy anything. I'm kidding. They <laughs> buy everything, the land and the... Yeah. <laughs> the if you're weaving them regularly. That's yes. right. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I didn't think about pasture. You're right. That Dennis, is the most cost effective. So. <laughs> but, Dennis agrees with Pete Moss. I do have a question, though. If it, Like most people's... Okay, no. Some people's adult birds are not confined. You know, like peat Moss, does that hold up in weather? I mean, you're not going to fill a run that's open aired with peat moss are you actually it dries out actually it dries out like if you're talking like after rainfall or something yeah it dries out more efficiently than pine shavings do so they're going to hold moisture longer <clears throat> look i i got the funny story so i learned about peat moss by pure accident when we had chickens in the backyard and my daughter was a teenager i had a bale of peat moss out by the chicken run okay so Every time I go out there to manage the chickens, you know, feed water, check them, get the eggs, all that stuff, this bale of peat moss just gradually over the summer disappeared, right? And it kept getting lower and lower and lower. One day I stuck my head in there to see what was going on. There was my barnyard black bantam hen. She was in there all day. She came out. She she come out to eat, drink, and whatever. But she spent her whole day fluffing around and dust bathing in that peat moss. Right. And she'd carry it off with her in her feathers. She'd come out of there, shake it off. So that's how I knew that they really liked peat moss. Yeah, I'm, I gotta say, my my peat moss and my dust baths doesn't even doesn't last. It just barely lasts a week. <laughs> they like it so much. Um, all right, Pam wants to know where can you buy peat moss? This wonder of all wonders. You can buy it at Lowe's, Home Depot. Um, garden stores, maybe? Yeah, any good garden center should have peat moss. Now, there appears to be, because of trucking and trucker availability from Canada, it seems to be hard to find this year. So if you do find it, you know, get extra. It doesn't go bad. Um, so it is a little more difficult to find this year than, than other years. All right, hold on. We're going to have Craig. Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask if peat moss is coming out of Canada. Um, <clears throat> comes out of Michigan, Wisconsin, but gotcha. the largest amount of it is coming out of Canada. Okay. Um, and I do want to recommend getting the Canadian peat moss because the government of Canada um, has some really strict guidelines on harvesting and not over harvesting peat moss. They realize that it's a natural resource. And they're paying attention to the regrowth. They're measuring, monitoring, you know, all of that. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, whereas you know, here in the states, you can just go in and pillage the land and take whatever you want, and you know, leave it barren for years to come, which I'm not a fan of. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of like the, the Canadian peat moss. I, I think they have better things going on with their harvesting. Ooh, excellent question. So a lot of the peat moss available has vermiculite bits in it. Is there a reason to worry if they eat that? Yeah, vermiculite will go in and swell up. 
So it's kind of a moisture holding thing that the bird can't digest the vermiculite. So it's just going to sit there and kind of clog up the, the gizzard and the digestive tract. Try to find some without the vermiculite. Um, depending on where you are, like down here, we can just go buy field peat moss and it's not a problem. But um, yeah, depending on where you are, it can be. But I would prefer it without the vermiculite added. It, it almost sounds like she's being sold potting mix of some sort rather than straight peat moss. Yeah. Right. Because they do put a lot of vermiculite and perlite in the potting mixes. Right. Well, and the first time I looked for it, I found I, I didn't find the compressed bales. Do you know what I mean like there was just, you know, little ten pound bags mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. peat moss and then finally I was like, Oh, Y'all kept describing, or somebody sent me a picture or something. I'm like, oh, go to a different part of the garden center and buy the big compressed bales, like the mm -hmm. pine shaving thing. Um, um, Ingrid Marie said that, that she can help you out with the, if you ask her about it. All right, so cost effective, because Greg, um, I would think cost effective bedding depends on where you live and what's available in the area you live in. I know that near seed corn plants find corn cob bedding the best i live near a window manufacturing company um where screen dried kiln bedding is the most cost effective so there's no one right answer so think yeah. creatively is advice um all right we are past time so i need to ask although we got to go late that one time because rip wasn't with us so uh, <laughs> that's you're telling on yourself but, yep <laughs> um but uh anybody have anything else they want to add or anybody other questions because i feel like we didn't hit on lots of stuff because there's but life well, just keeps going on. you know i i hit on what i had yeah. and i honestly i think we covered a lot of ground tonight. yeah we did cover a lot of ground uh, a lot of good information and, and a lot of really great questions as, as usual so y'all did good Laura wants to know where she can get her Poultry Keepers 360 shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if anybody would notice these. <laughs> I, I just have to go to I just have to go to my mailbox. That's all I want to do. Um, yeah, mine just showed up in the mail too. So yeah. Um, so you just check your mailbox every once in a while. Uh, oh. see if it, <laughs> You're going to get Terrible. the hoops up. No, that's probably not true, Alyssa, Laura. Alyssa just needs to go to her office to get hers. I know. Um, well, I'm in Texas her. right now, but I'll get there, I promise. Hold her as long as she kept her jacket on. Nobody would know that her shirt wasn't on underneath that. Um, <laughs> that's fair. I do. Somebody said earlier, and I want to get back to it, about the chicken garden and... I'm just going to, we'll talk about it. So is there any chance that, um, that feeding like plants that you grow and stuff like that, any chance that that in the end is going to cost you more or is it only going to be savings? I know I talked about my thing, but if you're actually growing the stuff, any problem with supplementing their feed with stuff? I've got a friend from? out in Washington state and, and he raises his, young birds on pasture uh, but he overseeds his pasture each year and he plants things like uh, clovers uh, brassica plants you know like rape collards whatever and um, forage radish and he just overseeds it and kind of works it into the soil lightly and he's got one of the best looking pastures I've ever seen I think it's fine as long as you're growing it and you're not trying to act actively supplement your feed with it because then you're cutting your yeah cutting that, your nutrition down. That's, way too. that's when you can get into trouble. Yeah. When I hear garden, I think of produce. Um, and maybe I'm thinking about that the wrong way. Um, but yeah, if you, if you feed too much produce, kind of like Karen's story, you can dilute down a lot of the nutrients. Yeah. You could ever do that real pretty easily. And give them lots of diarrhea. <laughs> it's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of moisture and a lot of water. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. All right. One last question for Ingrid. And don't answer peat moss because that's not the right answer. Oh. <laughs> Do feeding times affect how much feed is consumed? <laughs> I think I it could. 
I mean, if you fed them, so tonight I was late feeding them. So I get their their dishes were empty, and then I fed them right at dusk, like right right before they would go to roost. And I think they maybe were a little bit more piggy than they would have been had it not been like they were looking for it and it wasn't there. You know what I mean? Like right mm -hmm. when they wanted to eat. Yeah. That's just a feeling. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they could gorge maybe if you're late for feeding them too and you're offering them free feeding. That could be a possibility. But that's kind of what you're getting at. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Dennis, agree. This production has been made possible in part through the generous support of the Fur Trail Company, manufacturers of gardening and livestock products that are better naturally.